Friedman. I'm the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. I get to be the moderator of this, uh, this great panel, A New Deal for Nature. And um, what we're going to focus on this morning um, is uh, not just the climate question. We're going to focus on the whole biosphere. Uh, because really what is threatened, what the challenge is um, for the world going forward is not just climate, obviously. It's oceans, it's forests, um, it's soils, it's biodiversity. It's the whole enchilada, not just climate. Um, and I'm a, I'm a huge believer that, um, well, we, we know that we are deriving from this biosphere about $125 trillion a year in free services every year, free water filtration, uh, free storm surge protection, um, uh, free uh, soil um, uh, holding in place. We get enormous free services from this biosphere. Um, and we'll only appreciate just how much we get uh, if it's gone. I'm a huge believer that to preserve something as big as the biosphere, though, you have to have a scale solution. Uh, if you don't have scale, you have a hobby. I like hobbies. I used to build model airplanes as a little boy. I wouldn't try to preserve the biosphere as a hobby. <laughs> um, and I'm a huge believer to get scale uh, requires two things. There's only one thing as big as Mother Nature, and that is Father Greed. Um, also known as the market. So if you are not incentivizing and shaping the market to deliver scale solutions, uh, you have a hobby. And the second thing, of course, you need is innovation. Uh, and innovation at a speed scope and scale that can actually meet the challenge at the scale that it really is. And so we have an all-star panel uh, this, this morning. Um, uh, to my left is the president of Costa Rica, Carlos uh, Alvarado Cuseda. Um, uh, next to uh, the president is Christiana Pascal Palmer, the executive secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal. Uh, next to him is Sven Tori Holsetter, president and chief executive of Yara International, which uh, deals with agriculture, for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, next to him is my friend uh, Faiki Sebesma. He's the CEO of DSM, which is one of the most innovative country, companies in this realm. And lastly, Peter Thompson, who heads the UN, he's the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Oceans. So, Mr. President, if I could begin with you, because uh, Costa Rica has done, I think, one of the really most interesting scale aspirational goals of, of um, being a carbon neutral country. But give us your sense of how we get this scale, how we drive innovation from the perspective of Costa Rica. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, who are present here. Going directly to scale, I have to say that we've made, uh, for example, biodiversity and conservation an economical sustainable model. Currently, uh, it's about 6% of our GDP comes from ecotourism, which wow. provides jobs for people all around the country, and we are leveraging on the 5% of the biodiversity that we have in our territory to to produce that, not only conservation, but making an economic model out of it. So that, that's going directly to, to scale. But then uh, when you mentioned the word hobby, it, it ring a bell on me because somehow I have just briefly Please. this discussion with my sister. My sister studied economics and she's a specialist on economics and biodiversity. Mm. And I want, we were talking about um, an anecdote for the Native Americans in Costa Rica, how they perceive the jaguar. The jaguar. The jaguar. Yeah. Because from the typical Occidental perspective, the, 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 the large feline, like lion, is the king of the jungle because he's on top of the, of the food, food chain. chain. Yeah. Mm. For Native Americans, the jaguar is important because it's at the end of the food chain. Mm -hmm. And that depends. And they, they have this saying that if you see a jaguar, it's because the whole chain, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's what they represent. Yeah. Very interesting. I think that, ana like that analogy is what we need to use when we talk about biosphere yes. and humanity. Yeah. Our well-being, it's kind of depends the well-being of the rest, because sometimes we do not see those services on water, yes. on soil, on oceans. We take those for granted. 
Um, and I believe that's part of the problem. We're not uh, tackling what we're doing to the, to the environment to preserve it. And we need to, as, the, as this analogy, the main problem, it's here. Yes. Yeah. It's how we perceive reality. We perceive that those are for granted or that we can live comfortably without a Jaguar. Mm. And I think that's the frame we need to, the narrative we need to change. Is it, what would be the Jaguar for you know, the whole global system? Can you think of a, a, an analogy that may be, may be too difficult, but is there, is there something we should all be looking out for that tells us you know, the system's really working? Well, it's a, it's a tough one, but uh, I have to say Every country, I suppose, has their own Jaguar, their own you know, <laughs> uh, apex predator, whatever that, that could tell us that. I think we need to, 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 to leverage our, our goals in terms of, of protecting the biosphere in, uh, in more profound narratives. It's not only about ethics, because it is about ethics, but we need to consolidate a narrative that builds upon the ethics of conservation, growth and well-being for the people, and, uh, and how we can as, a, as humanity, not only catch up with all the legacy that we as a generation represent, but the key uh, that our generation represents for humanity. That's why, in the case of climate change, that narrative is so important because it's, for, it's really evident. In the, in the context of biodiversity, it's a bit more complex because the loss of biodiversity is so fast, but many people don't even know what we're losing. Mm -hmm. So I believe we need to work a lot on communication and narrative to inspire lots of people, not only to get to the enthusiast, as I believe many of the audiences, but to reach the, when we manage to reach those who are indifferent and touch their heart or touch their market, we'll get to, to more profound changes. That's really good. I think that we are actually the NOAA generation. We are actually the first generation of our species who has to think like the biblical Noah and save the last two pair. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I believe that we're the generation for whom later will now be too late. Mm -hmm. uh, well, late later is officially over. That's a great way of framing it with a profound narrative, actually. Well, you know, one of the problems is I think about this a lot as a journalist because I'm really believed to name something is to own it. You can name an issue, you can own the issue. And the problem with green for many years is the people who named it were the people who hated it. And they named it sissy, girly man, unpatriotic, unproductive, non-capitalistic, vaguely French. Vaguely French. Mm. Mr. <laughs> you know, Mr. Mr. Gore, you're looking a little French, you know. Um, and what I've tried to do in my own country is rename green. Geopolitical, geoeconomic, innovative, capitalistic, patriotic. Green is the new red, white, and blue. Okay, so um, you got to push back on these people. I believe in being a mean green. I'm not a nice green. Okay, I believe we have to be as mean as any oil and coal company. Rather than coming along and saying, would it be okay if we put up a solar panel here? Or if we save this species? You know, we, we need to be as tough as they are. Christian. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I think the president already made a few very important points. And let me, let me try to build on that. How do we get to scale? Well, I mean, in, in the Biodiversity Convention, which is the United Nations intergovernmental process, probably all your countries, minus the US, it's a party to the convention. 25 years, they've made commitments and policies and, and took action. And you know, we have a whole set of of tools in a way from a government perspective. Yet when we look at the science and the statistics are so dreadful. So we are not succeeding despite the many positive stories that are happening. I wouldn't qualify them as hobbies. They, they are, they are good stories around the world and we all sort of look up at Costa Rica who, who managed to, to turn this strictly conservation and scientific issue into a matter of economic development and, and social development. But how do we get to scale from there? It's, it's in fact broadening the narrative. I totally subscribe to the idea that this is about changing the narrative because we've been discussing biodiversity from an angle of, you know, we need to save the planet. We need to save nature. Uh, we need to save the trees or the species. At the end of the day, what we need to realize, first, we cannot save the planet ourselves. It's too arrogant to think that we can do that. 
it's a quest to save us. It's, you know, the nature and the planet will continue very well without us. The species will disappear, other species will appear. That's the evolution that for four billion years, it's the history of this planet. But how do we plug ourselves into this, into, into this exercise? To get to scale for me means a transition from a mindset where we treat this as an environmental problem to we treat this as a development problem. We look at biodiversity, not just species and, and uh, ecosystems, but the infrastructure that supports life and human development here. So then when the conversation becomes important in a government setting for presidents, for prime ministers, when the ministers of finance will be very concerned about how they protect or they invest in biodiversity in their country, where in boardrooms or in investment uh, in, in the financial sector, you will have those conversations. That's, I think, when we are going to make and see scale, because right now we are still, it's still in the realm of you know, conservation NGOs, environmental NGOs who are doing fantastic work, but it's not enough. Yeah. It, has to, it has to change. So we have a unique window of opportunity between now and 2020, because in 2020, the convention and all the countries we met in China. Uh, I think Mr. Xia was, was here in the room, He's I saw him. Talk uh, and um, that's when we have to, to put forward a new global policy for, for nature and biodiversity. If we manage to have a transformational approach to that, and what I mean by that, it's having this paradigm shift in which biodiversity is at the center of the conversation. It's at the center of the politics and policy making and presidents and politicians be, will be elected or not elected if they take care of this capital, then, then we're gonna see uh, probably, hopefully, the scale that we need. We have a big challenge in time. We don't have much time. Again, if we look at the science, and I think Sir David Attenborough was, was saying here the other days, 10, 15 years, roughly, by 2030, we need to bend the curve of biodiversity loss. And governments alone or environmental NGOs alone are not going to be able to do that. So we need businesses and we need the people, not only to be aware understand, and understand, but to take action. I think we are doing a lot in terms of awareness raising. You know, the, our friends in WWF, they have campaigns, National Geographics of the World, but how does this awareness translate into action? How can businesses who are really willing to engage, what kind of metrics, what kind of tools do they need to change their business practices? So that's on the scale side. On the innovation side, I would say, again, we have a fantastic window of opportunity with all the new technology that it's, it's, it's appearing. Um, um, blockchain, trustability, allowing us to, to go back to, to, to the roots, so to speak. Uh, we have to be careful, though. There are technologies that can be very harmful for nature, but uh, you know, th there is a, a space for conversation there. But I would look at innovation from a broader perspective. So not just technological innovation, but policy <coughs> innovation, uh, governance innovation, um, business model innovations, the whole business opportunity around, you know, eco-entrepreneurship, green business ideas. It's, it's, there is money to be made in going green. And I think the, the Chinese would use this expression a lot, uh, green is the new gold. Um, so I think in many ways, we are at a crossroads. Um, it's, it's very gloomy if we look at the data. On the other hand, there are many reasons to be optimistic because there are opportunities out there. What we are missing, and I think what we've been missing, it's um, a leadership from the top, political will to act, science is there. We just need to make sure that we communicate better, we change the narrative, we connect the dots between various initiatives and kind of we go together in this. Terrific, thank, thank you, you very much. So, uh, talk about, um, from the perspective of agriculture, the kind of innovation that's happening, why it's important, and what would help drive it even faster. Thank you, Tom. Of course, the, the food systems have a significant impact on biodiversity and also the, the link between food, food production, agriculture to to the, to the climate, 25% uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from, from agriculture. And uh, in, in this situation, and, and as you also recently pointed out in your column, Tom, let's focus on something that we all can agree on, that's math. Exactly. And uh, if I apply math to, to, to the issues we're facing, um, by year 2050, we need to increase food production by 50 to 60% well, to, 
uh, by 2023 to match the by, by, population by, going from 7.2 billion for, to about 8.2 billion uh, f uh, until uh, 2050. By 20, so, yeah. By, by 2050. Yeah. So, and um, with the current um, productivity increases that we see in agriculture, will need uh, land areas uh, for farming to increase by 593 million hectares, wow. which, which would um, uh, correspond to twice the size of India, which we Jeez. really cannot. Except, and um, we also need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture at that point by 70 percent. And these are overwhelming <coughs> yeah. numbers, but it's not impossible to, to deal with this. Uh, it is possible to produce enough food for the world on existing farmland. There are technologies out there, but how do we apply these yes. technologies? And uh, that's a challenge that we have received uh, several times. How do we convey that knowledge out there to the smallholder farmers? And uh, we have responded to that uh, challenge, and we are uh, now uh, releasing a prototype. This is a small clip, uh, and it, it's a clip that you can attach to pretty much any smartphone. Mm -hmm. What this clip does is it enables the farmers to go out in the field and measure, uh, for instance, nitrogen content in their plants, which wow. means that they can do precision farming. Mm -hmm. And that's taking a, a technology that has been reserved for really industrial scale farmers and, uh, yeah, well, and large farmers to smallholder farmers mm -hmm. to increase that productivity. So that's one, one example. And I'm also quite optimistic on what's happening now within the, the food industry. I'm chair of the Food Land Water Initiative in the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And we see that a, a great increase in membership and a, a great willingness to work across the, the value chain. I think it's important that we connect mm -hmm. all the way from the consumer back to the farmer and optimize the food production value chain. 40% of the food that is produced is lost, and we can do something about mm. that. Interesting. So th there are a lot of initiatives Great. here, and, and there are business opportunities as well. Terrific. Thank you very much. Faiki, tell me, um, uh, you guys are so good in innovation and that can provide this scale. My, my spies tell me you're even working on a clean cow. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> True. Uh, let, let me start by saying I am inhibited by the fact that I'm a biologist. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it is really remarkable what mankind did. It's the only species who changed the Darwinistic approach of adaptation. All the other species only survived by adapting themselves. And mankind was the first one to say, Adapting, the ultimate form of adaptation is not to adapt yourself, but to start to adapt these yes. circumstances <laughs> to your need. Interesting. And we were the only species turning that whole Darwinistic approach mm. uh, upside down. And to be honest, extremely successful. Um, so successful uh, that we need to rethink our own model because it's hurting us. And like you are saying, Mother Planet will survive. You see Jennifer of Greenpeace uh, sitting here her predecessor was always saying, I don't care about uh, Mother Planet, he will survive, but maybe mankind not, because the extreme form of adaptation that we applied is inhibiting and, and, and creating a problem for ourselves. And, and I think there is the crux. Now, if you go further on that one, the extreme form of adaptation is, uh, adaptation is also finding then again the uh, innovations and scale them up, and indeed, we invented an ingredient you can uh, give to the cows and, and fire the feed, and it reduced the methane emissions of the cow, and the cow take care of as much as uh, greenhouse gas as uh, global traffic is doing uh, from the rear and the front end of the cow, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, um, and what you can do is give that the ingredient, and it reduces the emissions with 30%. So uh, great innovation. We are very, very proud. So we go to the farmers. Are you interested? No, because it costs money. Yeah. And we don't pay for our own CO2 emissions, so we don't mind. Mm. OK, go to the feed process. No, we are not interested. Go to the governments. This is much cheaper solutions than global traffic. OK, who do we need to convince? Farmers. Oops, political <laughs> risk. Farmers is, uh, is a big risk. No. Now we go to dairy companies, uh, so this takes some time. Uh, they say, hey, maybe we can reduce the whole footprint of our supply chain. Yes. And here you see also, uh, I mentioned the carbon pricing could be a, an extreme important tool for governments to get those innovations also scaled up. The innovation is there, 
uh, but we need to scale it up. If I give another example, agricultural waste. If you look to our whole food system, we throw away 30% if you look already from the beginning, maybe it's up to 50% of all the agricultural production we throw away. We do now, what we now do is we take the agricultural waste, which is being incinerated, creating CO2, and we convert that into, into energy. Also there, to really scale it up, uh, we will be helped by, by policies. And um, that's the whole point. You, you need the, the framing, the regulatory and market price signals to really take it to scale. True. And I think, like I said, mankind adapted itself in an extreme form. But the fortune is we have the intellectual capabilities to find innovations. Right. The only thing is innovations come most likely from companies or, or academia. Uh, need to work together with NGOs, need to work together with governments, and, and that whole system need to work together, otherwise the innovations are there, Nobody's but confused. Tom would call that later on great hobbies. Yes. Thanks for the intellectual efforts, what you did, and maybe you get an academic prize for it, but it didn't save the world, mm -hmm. and we want to change the world, and therefore we need to work together in those systems. Um, and, and it shows you, though, I mean, how important, I mean, government is in, in shaping these markets to take innovations like you've got to scale, though. True. I mean, and, 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 and once again, it is our obligation, and I can go on and on, but uh, I wait till the moderator stops yeah. me. But um, <laughs> got, I mean, take another crack. <laughs> <ahead>. <laughs> Well, Christiana knows very better, uh, much better than I do. Uh, if we look to the whole agriculture, next to the fact that we throw away almost 50%, I think you know the figures better than I do, but uh, of the 1,000 crops we might have in the world, four to five crops take care of 80% of our production, mm. and the genetic code of those four or five crops, we unified, unified, unified that more and more in order to get higher yields creating big, big dependency genetically in terms of the lack of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So we need to really change our, our system here. Chile, a couple of years ago, uh, was out of its salmon production because they were breeding its salmons to the extreme genetic code, having the highest yield ever. And then they got a disease, a virus, killing all the salmon, and since there was no biodiversity and all of the same genetic code, um, they were out of business mm. for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So, and there the food supply uh, was disrupted. So I think we need to redefine uh, our own systems and, and adapt a little bit our way of adaptation. Like that. Peter, if the oceans could talk today, what would they be saying? Um, uh, they'd be saying plenty. Uh, look. Count Otto von Bismarck, the, the architect of German, German uh, unification, was asked what the difference was between a politician and a statesman. And uh, he said that a uh, statesman is a politician who thinks about his grandchildren. Hmm. And uh, it's up to us all now to be statesmen and stateswomen. Why? Because when we look at the world that we are giving our children and grandchildren, uh, we're in great trouble. Uh, and if you want somebody to tell you that, listen to that voice of the ocean that Tom just referred to. Because the ocean is telling us that everything, uh, bar of a few things, but everything is trending badly. Uh, if you look at ocean acidification, and if the ocean gets too acid, you know, you can't have life in it. Uh, you can't have coral reefs and so on. Uh, the ocean is warming. If it gets too warm, obviously sea level rises are coming up with the warming rates, uh, but if it gets too warm, you, again, you can't have life in the ocean. I come from Fiji, and the ocean is getting too warm there for many species of fish. They're leaving our waters and going to cooler places. Yeah. It's uh, changing ocean currents. I mean, what will that mean for Europe when the Gulf Stream no longer flows? Uh, it, uh, the ocean is telling us that uh, the, the, the fish are being overfished by mankind, 33% of uh, fish stocks are now heading towards extinction. They're being overfished. Uh, unconscionable levels of pollution coming into the ocean from our rivers and our uh, cities on the sh uh, seashores. Uh, and that's evident to the whole world now in the form of plastic, but also agricultural runoff, industrial runoff, sewage. 
So the ocean voice is a very clear message that we are in trouble as a species if we think in terms of our children and our grandchildren. So that's the voice of the ocean. Look, we can't be optimists. We can't be pessimists. We have to be pragmatists. That's the situation we're in to try and correct the wrongs that we've brought upon our relationship with the planet. We have to restore uh, uh, the respect and balance which used to be there. Uh, and we can do that as pragmatists. I sell something called SDG 14, Sustainable Development Goal 14. It's the ocean goal. I was involved in the creation of it in the le years leading up to 2015. When I was president of the General Assembly, I made the oceans the uh, uh, jewel in the crown. We had the first ocean conference during my presidency. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, the UN is currently considering the holding of the second UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, June 2020. That's a very important, I know a lot of people get conference fatigue, but I can tell you that is the time when we universally get together, humanity gets together, because United Nations conferences have to be agreed to by 193 countries before it can be a UN conference. So that's the important conference next year in Lisbon for the ocean, followed up, of course, by the Biodiversity COP in Beijing. And those two conferences taken together with uh, the, the Secretary General's Climate Change Summit in September, when all the world leaders will be together talking about climate, are going to pull together the story of what is the pragmatic way out of here. And the, you only have to think about something like coral reefs to see that those three conferences are just inseparably, uh, it's, just, it's one conversation from uh, biodiversity to climate to, to ocean. So uh, yeah, that's our job to um, make sure that those conferences are having the necessary outcomes. And I can tell you that they are. I'll conclude on this point, Tom. Uh, if you take something like marine protected areas, uh, okay, SDG 14 borrowed from biodiversity, IEG targets, and said we have to have as a target that by 2020, so this is the target maturing next year under SDG 14, that we have to have a target to have 10% of the ocean covered by marine protected areas. At that stage, we were back at about uh, you know, sub 5%. Uh, we're now at 7.5. I'm very confident we'll get to 10% by June next year. Now, what happens in June next year is obviously we don't sit back and say, well, that's great. Not at all. When the conversation goes on to Biodiversity COP in Beijing, and the conversation will be around, we want to get to 30%, because that is actually the rational uh, a scientific figure for marine protected areas. So what I'm uh, conveying to you is that gatherings such as this, we are producing the pragmatic ideas and we're putting them into place by our joint action. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, just come back the other way now. So I'm going to begin the second round of questions with you. And I want to ask everyone to answer this question. If you got to be a president, well, you're already president, but I mean, if you got to be <laughs> king for a day, you know, in your area, in your realm, What's the one thing you would absolutely order and impose to drive the kind of change and protection we need? Is it going from 10 to 30? What, in, in all of your areas, what would actually give us, you get to be king for a day, Peter, on the oceans, what's the one big thing you do? As bad a Mandate. shape as we are in, in our relationship with the planet, yeah. the good news is that we have a plan to get, out, to, to get back to that relationship of respect and balance, which we should be in. And that plan is the Paris Climate Agreement and the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Implemented with integrity, that is uh, a secure future for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. good, and good. so my answer to you would be okay. implement with integrity the plan that humanity has devised. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What would you, you feel free to re react to anything that Peter said earlier you did, but what would be, what would be the one big thing that would make clean cows scale everywhere? <laughs> Well, if I build on Peter, and, and, and thanks for being king or president for a day, I appreciate it. It would be fun. Uh, building on what Peter said for the, for the oceans, uh, we are very dependent on the oceans, also for our food uh, supply, uh, and I'm very, very concerned what's happening. So therefore, we invented sustainable fishing. Salmons, etc., are not emptied massive anymore out of the ocean, but are in captivity. Great. Do we do it? Is that really sustainable? No, because we still empty the ocean because we have the small fish we need to fish to give to the big fish, otherwise they don't grow. 
Do we need to do that? No, the small fish eat the algae, so the algae raw materials need to be there. So can we take the algae, put them in a fermenter, leave the ocean as it is, and give that oil to the big fish? Then we preserve the ocean, another project that we do. If I would be king, if I would be president, I would focus on innovations, on scaling, on getting rid of the hobby, on investing more money in innovations. Because I'm concerned also here in Davos, if I may say a small remark, that we discuss conventions, papers we sign, targets we have set, and all those kinds of things. And then I see Mother Planet looking to us and say, ooh, they signed a convention. I'm very happy. <laughs> and they set targets. Oh, I'm so happy. I mean, Mother Planet, at the end of the day, is helped by changing things which we do differently than before. And that most likely will be innovations and doing things in a different way of how to deal with the oceans, how to deal with our energy, and those kinds of things. Doing things, innovation, changing things that I would stimulate. You know, you know Rob Watson, who invented the uh, green buildings uh, for NRDC a long time ago, likes to say, Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. Mm -hmm. That's, That's all true. she is. You can't talk her up. You can't talk her down. You can't say, Mother Nature, we got a protocol for you. <laughs> or Mother Nature, we're having a bad year in the economy. Could you take a year off? She's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And to put it in American terms, baseball terms, Mother Nature always bats last. And she always bats a 1,000. Do not mess with Mother Nature. Thank and you. that's what we're doing. Thanks, Pete. Sven, uh, you get to be president for a day Thank of you. the that, world. Uh, open not just Costa Rica, uh, the world. <laughs> <laughs> the, the world. All right, what I, what I would do is, is to um, make sure that we use technology to create transparency on uh, the impact of food production. Uh, because today, I, I don't believe anyone in this panel or in, in the audience uh, have any <coughs> idea of the carbon impact of the food that we eat. Uh, and uh, so I mean, transparency, the, understanding. Understanding that. The choices you make at the supermarket. Exactly. Yeah. When you're at the supermarket, you can pick up a food item. You can see the calories. You can see the vitamins and, right. and nutritious, uh, the nutrition content. You have no idea what the carbon footprint is. Interesting. And if you don't know that, how can you direct your spending hmm. towards more Very sustainably good. produced food? What and would surprise me if I went to the supermarket and I saw the carbon footprint on the with the calories and the carbohydrates? Yeah, uh, perhaps then you would be willing to direct your spending towards more sustainably right. produce, produced food because we are faced with some of the same challenges yeah. that that Fike is uh, faced with. That he, he, there are solutions out there, and we expect farmers to do something uh, about it but we're not willing to pay them for doing it. And, and then we don't have a sustainable business. So uh, we, we need to create that transparency so Very we can good. direct like our spending and then incentivize farmers to do what's right for the environment uh, as well and not put all the demand on, right. on the farmers and, yeah. and, and expect that it just happens by as a miracle. This could be a business, but we need to bring scale and through that scale, it will be self-financing because we'll be able to reduce food waste and, and I can help finance this. But uh, we like need that, that first transparency. So that will be my Great. action as president. Christiana, queen for a day. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to do two or three things. First, I, I'll go to the root of the problem. And I think the roots of the problem are in the perversive incentives mm -hmm. and in subsidies and the economic development model who does not account for nature and natural capital mm -hmm. in the growth models. Um, second, I'll work with uh, my ministers of finance and development and planning to completely redesign the, the um, incentives, the tax incentives, the fiscal incentives, the economic incentives, so that we support the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the risk takers, those who come up with all ideas and help shift the, the, the path from the business as usual to a transformative path where all these solutions can have a life and go to scale. But for that, you need also the government and the policies to support it. So that's what I'm going to do. And third, I'm going to invest in education. I'm going to make mm -hmm. ecology compulsory in school so that from early age, kids and, and, and teenagers understand the planet and how it functions, because I think part of the problem is we do not understand the biology of it. Um, and from there, I, I'll take it to the citizens mm. and make it accountable as a politician. If you, you have to be accountable for how did you manage all the resources, including the natural capital, and what do you 
uh, leave behind you and forward to those who come after you. These are all excellent. So, Mr. President, Costa Rica. Vote for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Costa Rica is way too small for you. I'm making you president of the world now. Um, uh, you, but you, you get to mandate whatever you want. What, what would it be for you? Well, I'm a bit of a dilemma because for the rest of the panel is a bit hypothetical for me. It's, I, I, it's a must. Exactly. <laughs> I have exactly. to do something. Exactly. So what we're going to do is on February 24th, we're going to launch our decarbonization plan. Amazing. And it's a plan for the decades to come. What's the goal of it? We are going to decarbonize our economy in the midterm. Go to zero. And in my term will be, uh, the goal is the, the, the shift on the curbs. That means that start decreasing the shift, the curve of uh, consumption of mm -hmm. fossil fuels and without affecting the growth curve. And we managed to do that with a plan that we, this plan we're launching on February. It has uh, five axes, but the main ones are transportation. Our electric, uh, our electricity is 99% renewable and clean. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to plug that uh, matrix on the transportation. Mm -hmm. And for that, we're building electric, two electric trains, and we're giving tax relief on uh, electric vehicles, and uh, we're do, making uh, uh, routes for biking, and yeah. also we're working on agriculture and on residue management or waste management to reduce those, um, those emissions. Um, and I believe 70 years ago, Costa Rica abolished the army. We have yeah. no army. Amazing. So to be faithful to that legacy in our generation, my generation has posed the, the challenge to abolish the use of fossil fuels. And I think that's a narrative also to inspire, to inspire people to do things. And I, I believe we should not um, underestimate the power of passion and, and inspiration on this based on data, based on yeah. fact. For example, when I was listening to the example of the, of the clean cow, there, I, I know lots of people that will be pushing for that to happen in our country, to, to have that enforced in our country. And that discussion we're having Let's now... Let's make a million deal after this meeting. Yes, we talked. Uh, my <laughs> Minister you, of my Commerce commission? is over there. <laughs> Currently, we're having that same discussion with plastic. Very related to the ocean, but it's the people pushing on politicians or statesmen, women, the people pushing for better laws on plastic. And currently in Congress in Costa Rica, they're discussing uh, a, ch a, a complete change on our policies of plastic. Uh, and even the corporate, they're willing to be part of the discussion because they know they have to change. Why? Because people are demanding that change. So if we demand those changes in plastic, in cows, <laughs> then things are going to stop. Uh, but, but people need that purpose. Why, what triggered the, the change on, uh, on plastic? It was the whole discussion on the oceans. When the young generation started to realize the pollution on the ocean, and for a country as us in Costa Rica, we have uh, coast in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. Mm. And we live a lot about from the ocean. But when you get to see turtles dying mm. because of plastic or uh, the whole pollution, people start feeling things and they want to be part of change. Yeah. Mm. So I believe those narratives are not only narratives, are drivers mm. for change. And we need to, to put those on the table and, and it's part of a... Uh, we need to compete yes, in, that, in that arena. But I think those are really powerful tools yeah. to compete and to win. Also because it's, it's, we're winning being on the right part of the equation, on the right side of history. Well, we may be at that mindset change. You know, um, Something very important is happening in California right now, which is that the biggest utility in America is basically declaring bankruptcy because of a climate event, uh, mm. PG&E. Um, is going to go bankrupt uh, because of all the lawsuits over fires started in incredibly dry ground that was first made hugely scaled by uh, vast rainfalls, created the vegetation, then we got a drought, it all dried up, and then the electric company's faulty equipment sparked the wildfires that caused billions of dollars in damage. They are being sued into bankruptcy. Yeah. And I think we're about two business cycles away 
from climate becoming a kind of nice to have for your company to being a must have, mm -hmm. save the business. Mm -hmm. And you know, unfortunately we've been sitting here and I've been coming here for 25 years, so I can, I can say this, you know, that we're basically, we've been basically waiting for the perfect storm. A storm big enough to end the climate debate, but not so big as to end the world. Okay, that, that's what we've been sitting around waiting for. And the mini version of that is what's going on in California now. And out of this will become come a lot of change. We, we need a new president. Unfortunately, we don't have a president like you. Uh, we have a president who's a moron. And, um, uh, but once, you know, hopefully if, if we get a new president at this juncture, we could, we could really uh, behave more like Costa Rica, which have an impact. Uh, I, I want to call on Manuel. Where's Man Man no, I, Manuel, would you just say a few words from WWF perspective, and then we'll open the floor. Thank you, Tom. This is a debate about the deal for nature, scalability, and innovation. Yeah. And, and let me say that there are many elements to secure that we are going to scale our action. The first one it is that we have already adopted the decision for the 2030 agenda and for the 2050 pathway, a decarbonized economy and a resilient economy. And we cannot achieve those targets if it is not by addressing nature loss, because it is not possible to have a resilient economy or a decarbonized economy, mostly in tropical countries, which main source of emission it is the forest, yeah. but it is the land used among some others. So that is my first element. The second element it is that in the risk report, the 2019, it has appeared biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. What that means it is that it is starting to be an economic thing. Right. So to address right. biodiversity yeah. and nature loss, it is an economic, but we should continue working in the economic <coughs> case for nature. That is important. I am used to saying that it is not just about nature-based solution. It is about nature-based decisions. So we should take political, economic, and social decisions, putting nature in the top of the priority. The third reason it is that things are happening. Yara, DSM, among some others, they have shown that they are moving their own agenda, probably mostly based on climate reasons, but in some way adopting nature decisions, and that is good. And things are happening, and that is why it is so important to have the forest, food, and land coalition addressing, and it is a sector that is <coughs> strongly growing and showing climate action, and in some way are connecting to nature action. But there is a but. So scale and innovation, it is happening in some way. And it is a thing about market. It is a thing about risks, about the economy, but also political will. And unfortunately, that is not happening. The political will, is, it is not there to have countries mainstreaming nature into their planning process. That is why it is important, the deal for nature. Because it is the missing point in the political will and in the political decision making uh, uh, point of view. Yes. So that is why we should get a deal for nation by 2020. That it could be a strong, clear, and single yeah. decision adopted by countries to send to the world, to the business sector, to, to different authorities in different levels, a clear message that we are going to address nature laws to achieve the 2030 and to move into that, uh, a strong 2050. Last comment about the deal for nation. Yeah. How can we define a strong target? Because it is very difficult when we think about nature to have the equivalent of the 1.5, no? What are that behavior that we are trying to change? Because we know that we will continue intervening nature because it is in the base of our economy. The point it is how can we intervene the nature but <coughs> by not disrupting it? So the point it is not to disrupt so, so the deal for nature should define a clear target to change the behavior and to have <coughs> countries and decision makers domestically mainstreaming nature in their planning process and in their economic decision. That is why it is so important to have 2020 as a milestone to address nature laws, and I am sure that COP15 in China, in Beijing, and with the CBD, we are going to work strongly on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Temper, one quick question before we go to Minister Xi. Right here, yeah, please. You. Thank you. Ivana Kotoswa from CNN. We do have a plan to avert... From where? I didn't hear what you said. Where are you CNN. from? CNN. CNN. Uh, we have a plan, but we are not following the plan. There's been a research recently showing that out of the G20 countries, only India is currently on target to meet its targets. Um, so how can we actually save the planet if none of the big countries is not playing balls and if the world's biggest economy is decisively not part of the plan. Do you have one person want to take that on? Thank you, go ahead. Well, I think the best, the fastest way 
is to put a financial economic incentive to do it. Uh, because otherwise we need to wait too long for the goodwill uh, of all the different people. I think a price on carbon is the most effective tool. Read the Wall Street Journal last week. Uh, Benanti, Greenspan, etc. advocating for that summers. Um, so um, it, that helps because what that does also, not <coughs> stimulate companies, but stimulate also investors to ask different things from companies. And that, for me, a financial economic incentive moves the needle the fastest mm -hmm. next to our moral responsibility. But that takes normally, is my expectation, a little bit longer. It shouldn't, but it does. We're fortunate to have uh, China's representative um, on climate change here, Minister Xi, and I'm going to ask you if you would to close the meeting uh, with your analysis of the situation. Please. I need you to put your there's translation on your headsets. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I will speak in Chinese. I listened to our panelists very carefully. So I would like to share the following points. First, it is true that the humankind faces many uh, challenges because on the one hand, we should ensure economic development, food security. At the same time, we have to uh, face or address the problem of climate change, uh, the acidification of oceans, and uh, protect our forests. It is true that our ecosystem has uh, faced a lot of uh, destruction and uh, uh, threats. Economic development, uh, social uh, progress are going uh, hand in hand uh, in a way uh, with uh, climate or environmental uh, problems. But I think we can strike a balance. And uh, I think we, sh we can achieve a harmony or uh, this kind of uh, peaceful uh, coexistence between human being and uh, nature. And uh, to achieve this, I think it is really important to change how we uh, develop our, uh, how we develop and how we live on the planet. We need to develop circular economy, and we should also have institutional innovation. I think we can really combine economic and uh, social development with the protection of our oceans, forests, our environment and ecosystem. Uh, so as to ha achieve coordinated uh, development. I think this is completely achievable. But to achieve this, of course, we need innovation, technological innovation, and institutional innovation. Uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, the uh, government, of the governments should have political will. They should fix a very specific targets and then mobilize all uh, parts of a society uh, to devote their efforts uh, to achieve this goals. And we should also have incentives. Uh, these incentives could be uh, economic incentives or other uh, policies for the market. Uh, for example, uh, a pricing, a taxation, uh, the development of a carbon market, so as to encourage uh, everyone to protect an uh, ecosystem and uh, to achieve economic development. But it should be sustainable uh, development. I think we can really achieve this at the same time. In China, we are making a lot of efforts in this uh, aspect. Uh, we have put forward the concept of eco eco civilization, uh, which is to ensure uh, the economic development and the social uh, progress are uh, in line with uh, the protection of environment, our oceans and forests. Of course, we do face difficulties and challenges. But I think with uh, the concept, with the guidance of this concept of coordinated or harmonious development uh, between human being and uh, the planet, will we be able uh, to have this low cost, uh, low risk, and a synergetic and a mutually beneficial path uh, for development. And I am quite confident that we can find uh, this kind of uh, path. And um, 
in China, uh, we have seen that some progress has been achieved. So uh, we really uh, look forward uh, to the uh, 2020 uh, COP, and uh, we hope that at the uh, 2020 COP uh, conference, uh, we will uh, set even more specific uh, targets and uh, through multilateral uh, cooperation, uh, can we achieve uh, the targets uh, that we have set for ourselves and uh, the development of for the humankind? For a couple of quick questions, so I want to go back all the way back there. Yeah. Yes, so my name is Patrick Ullman Ward. Um, I'm a geologist and I'm the CEO of Danagas, um, and I'm a passionate environmentalist. So David Attenborough has been my hero practically most of my life. Uh, so I just want to say that these things are not incompatible. Uh, I think that it's important, <coughs> given the scale of the challenge we face in climate change, uh, and I am a believer in climate change, and I think most of my colleagues in my industry also believe in, in, in that, and that we see that as a, a real problem that needs to be solved. It's a problem that we need to solve collectively, uh, excluding part or one part or another part uh, of the system is not going to get us to where we need where we need to be. It's going to have to be a holistic approach. Uh, if you were to make me president of the world for one day, then go ahead. Thank you. Uh, then carbon pricing has got to be mm. the single, in my view, yeah, very the single most important driver for reducing CO2. Uh, can I just illustrate that? Please uh, go ahead. Very briefly. There was a, a comment earlier on that uh, Germany is moving towards uh, is decarbonizing its economy. Germany is not decarbonizing its economy. German CO2 emissions have barely changed over the last 10 years. Why is that? Because they've chosen from policy to, to go for an energy mix of renewables and lignite for power generation. If you compare that to what's happened, for example, in the UK, where by putting essentially a carbon price in place uh, and a combination of uh, renewables with gas for power generation, CO2 levels have come down 70% in the last 10 years uh, to the lowest level since the 1890s. So policy has got a very important role to play. Uh, and, and I think that the main driver that will get us a long way towards achieving our climate goals is to make sure that carbon pricing influences the market and we let the market do what it's most efficient at doing, finding the lowest cost solution. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. <coughs> I just got to go around as quickly as I can. Mm -hmm. No, no that behind you and then you. Okay. Two in a row. We got the microphone in the neighborhood. Great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jennifer Morgan from um, Greenpeace International. And I have a question for Mr. President, but I, I just wanted to respond because the time in Germany is now. So on Friday, literally, the Coal Commission is going to get together and hopefully will decide to phase out coal by mm. 2030 well. with an early start. But in order for that to happen, Chancellor Merkel really needs to engage on this, mm. so she's here. So therefore, this is a bit of an appeal for all of you speaking to her that she needs to deliver on this. This is mm -hmm. her legacy. And we can talk longs about policy mechanisms, but this is the here and now that we can get with the just transition. So. That's one thing I would do if I was yeah, president great. for the day. <laughs> um, but the other thing, I, I was just curious, very inspired by what you're doing in Costa Rica and a very important year for your part of the world with the, cl the climate talks coming first to you uh, for a pre for the ministerial and then to mm -hmm. Chile. So I, I'd love to hear what your vision is or how you can work with your colleagues in South America and Central America because I think the more examples that we have uh, and noting what's happening in Brazil right now as well, uh, we really need your leadership on a regional level. Mm. Thanks very much. Good question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Brandon, go ahead, do, do it quick and then we'll get one well, more Well, thanks on, on the question. And I recently get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my take on it is, in our case, the best way to influence is lead by example, I believe. And when you have an example of having conservation in biodiversity and at the same time being economically positive or reversing deforestation through reforestation and making it economically positive or uh, having a 
a decarbonization plan that's inspiring young people. Those are examples that when you look at the mirror and you say, okay, it's like when you see something you would like to have and you say, hmm, I might change my behavior and, and do something. So we do believe that it's through, through example that we need to, to inspire others to join the, the cause. And that's, the, that's our take on it. One good example is worth a thousand theories. Uh, you, last question, make it good. It's just a comment, so it's Please, not even a question. Even very better. short. And it's to remind people that actually there's a new weapon here which can be very useful in this context, and it's the globalization of social media. It's mm -hmm. really only happened in the past five years. And it means in some issues, it can be very powerful for making businesses change in five minutes. So buy now, for example, in the UK, any business making or producing or having on their counter a straw, a plastic straw, would be ostracized. Things just changed instantly because hmm. of the social media power. I'm on the board of Burberry. I joined the board of Burberry last uh, February. We got a new chairman as well in May. Uh, it turned out that we were destroying our merchandise when it was past its sell-by date, as it were. Almost 50 million pounds worth of our merchandise had been destroyed in the past year. Well, when this was discovered, the social media theme that rocketed to the top was Burberry Burns. Now, we were burning some of it, we weren't burning all of it, but it took me about five minutes to send an email to our chief executive, mm. and it took our chairman six minutes, and it took our chief executive about three weeks to have a completely new policy. Mm. And it was the social media that did that, that didn't exist on that scale globally. We were getting it from China, we were getting it from around the world, really not just example. London. I think it's a very powerful way. Well, it's great. This has been a, I told you you were at the best panel in Davos, <laughs> and I think we delivered. I want to thank all our panelists. Minister, she, thank you very much. Carlos, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.